Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to all our friends and listeners out on the West Coast, and welcome to another edition of the Otolaryngology Show, or the ENT Show, if you want something a whole lot easier to pronounce. I am your host. I'm Dr. Sean McMenemy. I'm a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and neurological surgery here at NYU Langone Health, and bringing you each and every week the ENT Show on Dr. Radio. As you know, this is a collaborative effort between the good folks at SiriusXM and NYU Langone Health, bringing you a hopefully an informative and interactive show each and every week. There's lots of ways to interact with us, and during the history of this show, which is over five years now, hard to believe, time flies when you're having fun, uh, you guys have done such a great job with all your questions, emails, all of it's great. We want it to continue. I know it will. 877-NYU-DOCS is the phone number. If the little letters rubbed off your phone, that's 877-698-3627. You can email us if that works uh, better for you. Docs, D-O-C-S, at SiriusXM.com. You ask if we are in the Twitterverse, and yes, of course we are. It's at uh, SiriusXM. Uh, and at Dr. Radio. Uh, mine is at Dr. Sean M C M E N, and it's at NYU Docs. Uh, Facebook is a great place to uh, get a hold of information about the show. If we mention any links, we'll post them on the Dr. Radio Facebook page. So if you're driving around, you don't have to worry about uh, writing them down. Um, and also, on demand schedule is on the Facebook uh, Dr. Radio page. Uh, also, the app, if you don't have the SiriusXM app, should get it. It's free. Download it. You can listen to Dr. Radio on demand whenever you want. Uh, last week was cool. We were, had a special edition where we were, the three of us, Dr. Voigt, Dr. April, and myself, were live from the floor of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery from New Orleans, and that was pretty fun. In my segment, we talked about cochlear implants, so if you want to learn more about cochlear implants and if you are uh, someone who missed that show, you can listen to it on demand. You just go to the SiriusXM app and search it or the SiriusXM.com slash on demand. You can get all these shows uh, on demand and uh, and that was a good one. It was fun coming from New Orleans. Very hot, very humid, and uh, but nonetheless enjoyable. Today, on today's show, in hour one, be joined on the phone with Dr. Katherine Palmer, who is a president-elect of the American Academy of Audiology, an associate professor. Uh, at the University of Pittsburgh and the Director of Audiology at the University of Pittsburgh. And we're going to talk hearing loss. We're talking about hearing aids, cochlear implants, and maybe if you're new to the system or need help getting into the system, how to go about finding out how to get that hearing test. How do you navigate the system to start the process of diagnosing hearing loss for either you or a loved one? So give us a call with your questions about hearing loss or hearing aids or how to enter the system. Uh, 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627. In hour two, a good friend of mine will be joining me. Uh, and her name is Irene Taylor Brodsky. She's an Oscar-nominated and Emmy and Peabody Award-winning filmmaker. Her first film was Here and Now. That won an Audience Participation Award uh, at the Sundance Film Festival in 2007. Very cool film. I think you can still get it on Netflix. We'll ask her about that. Her sequel uh, film is coming out now. It's called Moonlight Sonata, Deafness in Three Movements. And it premiered at Sundance in this year, and it's, I believe, in theaters in New York and Los Angeles now. So you can Google it and search it, and by all means, go see it. Uh, we'll talk to her about her films and her family and her family's hearing loss. Uh, so if you have questions for Irene Taylor Brodsky, uh, award-winning filmmaker, that will be at the top of the hour, too. And then at the half hour, 1.30 to 2, I'll take your open phone lines. Call me with any questions you have. Hearing loss, vertigo, dizziness, cholesteatoma, acoustic neuroma, whatever it is, I'll take your phones and uh, give you my best answer. At the phone lines, again, 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627. We have phone lines open to talk to Dr. Catherine Palmer, who's on the phone with us now. Dr. Palmer, welcome to Dr. Radio. Thank you so much. It's so nice to join you today. Very happy to have you with us. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself for the audience. Sure. So, um, as you said, I'm here at the University of Pittsburgh. I have an ideal um, position in, in my mind. I, I teach here and I run the AUD program, so the people who want to become audiologists um, come to our program. I run a research lab where I 
focus a lot on thinking about the impact of untreated hearing loss on health outcomes, especially in, in adults. And then I am the director of audiology for the UPMC system, so that's our medical system. Um, which gives me kind of an, a neat laboratory to try new things and, and help patients in new ways and, and see how that works. So a mix of research, teaching, and clinic is what I do. And I'm also the president-elect of um, the American Academy of Audiology, as you mentioned. So that's a new new challenge and an exciting time to be um, involved in that. It's a very exciting time in our in our field and in, in, in hearing health care. So for people who don't know, uh, tell us a little bit about the American Academy of Audi- Audiology. What's its function, what's its purpose, how does it help folks out there? Sure. So it's the professional organization of audiologists, and and the whole goal is to promote quality hearing and balanced care for people who need that care. And so we believe strongly that advancing the profession of audiology very much um, promotes quality hearing and balanced care. So, you know, we're the people that people can get to to find customized solutions um, to the variety of problems they, they have, and that could involve hearing, it could involve balance, it could involve tinnitus, ringing in your ears, it could involve sound sensitivity. So we do that through promoting um, and supporting research, public awareness, education, and advocacy to make sure people um, can get to the health care providers that they need. Yeah, which is, which is really uh, crucial. So for somebody out there who might be listening uh, and doesn't feels they may have some hearing loss or a family member or loved one may have some hearing loss and not exactly sure how to go about the process of obtaining a diagnosis and a proper diagnosis and follow that with a treatment plan. How how does the best advice go for helping someone enter the system? So if you are an adult and you think you might have some hearing problems or experience tinnitus ringing in your ears, anything like that, you, you want to take action. So it's very confusing, as I think is what you're getting to for the consumer of what to do. So if you just Google that, you'll come up with all these different kinds of paid ads of you go here, you go there. But complete hearing health care involves an audiologist and, as you know, an ENT. So when you think of the two of us on the line, you know, we represent complete hearing health care. And you can get into that system um, going directly to the audiologist. Audiologists are trained, so they do the testing, and they can sort out if you really need a medical solution to your problem, and they're going to then get you to the ENT you need to go to. Or if it's really not a medically treatable problem, then you're where you need to be with the audiologist to go down the pathway of, you know, how can we help you have a solution that works in your lifestyle for your hearing loss? you know, in your circumstances. And as you know, they could also go directly to an ENT, and the ENT is going to work with an audiologist who's going to do the testing. And same thing, they're going to get to the right path either way. Right. It's it's uh, it's really crucial for, I'm an otologist, as you know, uh, right. ear doctors, ear surgeon, and really we have to have great audiologists, and we're lucky, we're blessed here at NYU to have great audiology and a great cochlear implant team. So we work with them on a daily basis to come up with correct diagnoses and then treat those diagnoses based on, on, a, on a super accurate uh, audiogram. Right, and that's the customization of it. You know, and I think that's confusing for people when they see ads, um, you know, for very inexpensive amplification-type devices and thinking, well, is, is that all I need? Um, you know, and, and my advice is, you know, go in and have that time to get an actual test and diagnosis so, so we know what's happening, and if there's a medical treatment, we get you on the right path, and that doesn't get ignored. Um, but if there's not, then you have that time with an audiologist, and the first piece of customization is that conversation of, okay, we now we know how you hear. Now tell us about yourself, and, and that's so important. What's your life? Style. You know, what do you do for, I always ask patients, what do you do on a regular weekday? What do you do on a weekend? You know, are these people who are, you know, active in their, their mountain climbing? You know, there's going to be a different solution if you're out in the rain all the time versus not. So, you know, that kind of customization helps. And if you're someone who maybe could use a very simple amplifier, the audiologist can let you know that. Um, and, and so that appointment is going to save you a lot of time and um, energy and potentially money to know where what's the right path to go on. And it's a process, you know, finding that solution. I think we make a mistake of thinking about hearing loss as a very acute problem, as if you go in and, and someone's going to fix that. And, you know, 90% of hearing losses are, are permanent hearing losses. It's not an acute problem. It's really a chronic problem or a chronic issue for the person. So, you know, we want to be a partner in those solutions. And the, the patient themselves is very much a partner in that, what, what works for them. We always say the best 
hearing aid is the one the patient will wear. Yeah, so that's, we, we need that, to work on that together. That's absolutely the right answer, right? Because if you're not going to wear it, it's not going to help you. So absolutely those things not. have to line up. If you're just joining us, this is the ENT show. We're joined by Dr. Catherine Palmer, who's the president-elect of the American Academy of Audiologists, and she's also the director of audiologists for the University of Pittsburgh Healthcare System in Pittsburgh. We're taking your calls. We have phone lines open. Give us a call. If you or a loved one have hearing loss, you have questions about hearing aids, how to make the diagnosis, how to go about getting a hearing aid fitted, or maybe potentially a cochlear implant, give us a call now. Open lines 877-NYU, docs 877-698-3627. Email docs, D-O-C-S, at SiriusXM.com. Give us a call, and we will take your calls and try and get you a great answer. I wanted to talk about, because a lot of people have questions about, well, what, what type of hearing loss do I have? Why do I need an audiogram? Why can't I just go in and get a hearing aid uh, without having a hearing test going through this whole system, as it were? Uh, why do we need a hearing test? What's the benefit, and what are the different types of hearing loss? You know, the hearing test is going to give us uh, several pieces of information, and the, and the first one that we touched on is, is really going to be that differential diagnosis of what's causing this hearing loss. And if what's causing the hearing loss is something that can be medically treated, we, we want to do that, and, and you're not going to know that without that test. You, you're simply not going to have that information. Um, and, and some of that is just a benefit if, if we can, you know, solve a hearing problem and an ear health problem, that's great, let's do it. But more to the point, if it's really an ear health problem and we let that go, then there are other consequences that really can be you know, very serious. So we don't wanna let that piece go. But let's say you go in and, and you really have permanent hearing loss. Uh, maybe you've been exposed to noise for quite a bit of your time. Maybe you were you know, born with this or it's something that's progressing. Um, you know, maybe you're aging and, and that's a you know, part of, it can be certainly part of aging. Um, then what we're gonna get is the information of degree and configuration, which really is what we need to make a customized solution for a person. So when you think of um, a hearing aid, you know, I think one of the um, real problems in, in consumers kind of navigating um, this part of healthcare is typically the pricing for hearing aids has been bundled. So the typical patient or consumer thinks, oh, that's the price of the gadget. You know, that's the, the price of the device, when, when actually it's the price of the device and the price of all the services and care, and usually care for a couple um, years. So that's, that's called a bundled price. Um, and I think it's misleading that people don't understand that separation because they don't realize in that sense what the audiologist brings to the table. And so the hearing aid itself is, you can think of it as a blank digital chip. So hearing aids are amazing. The technology continues to improve. But if they're not actually fit to that individual's ear canal and hearing loss, which takes measurements, so we put a microphone in that ear canal, we make measurements to actually tune the different pitches, we tune for the different input levels, Without that, you have a non-customized solution that certainly may help you a little bit, might be better than not um, having a, a device, but it, but it certainly won't give you the full benefit that you could have. Right, and we make, I make surgical decisions every day based on audiograms, so they have to be accurate because I'm going to make a decision whether to take someone to the operating room or not based on their hearing loss, and the operations we have are totally different based on the different subtypes of hearing loss, so there's really... There's a sensory neural type hearing loss, which as you mentioned is very frequently uh, due to the effects of aging or noise exposure, noise being the one uh, factor that's ultimately in our control. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a, usually a slow, progressive type of hearing loss. But there is one subset of that that I think is important. We talk about it a lot on this show, which is someone that wakes up with a sudden precipitous type of hearing loss. And that's a whole different ball of wax, right? No pun intended. Uh, absolutely, and and that's that's an emergency. I mean, I think you'll agree. And so when we think of that, is that someone? If you wake up or, or you know it's the middle of the day and you have sudden hearing loss, you you need to go get care, and you need an otologist or an ENT, and the audiologist will be part of that. Clearly, they'll they'll be together in that because the audiologist will be doing the the testing and getting that information. But I'm I'm always surprised by patients who will come in you know, maybe in two, two months later and say, oh, a couple months ago I lost all the hearing in my right ear. 
and you think, really? You know, that didn't kind of cause you to want to take action. Um, I was liken that to if you woke up and couldn't see out of one eye. I'm thinking you would, you know, show up in the emergency room. Right. So, yeah, we do like to really make sure, you know, your audience understands that that's not normal to suddenly um, not be hearing. And if it means, you know, earwax shifted and blocked your ear, awesome. <laughs> then, then we'll get it cleaned out and you'll be on your way. But if it's something else, you want to be, you know, with the right, team of healthcare professionals right there that day when that happens. Right, and as you say, it is really a, an otologic emergency, an audiological emergency, and the reason is that there's a treatment window of opportunity. Once you get past two to three months somewhere in that zone, outside of that, my ability to restore hearing uh, with medication is severely limited, so you really want to get in. I can't tell you how many times I hear the story of I went to the urgent care uh, and they gave me some Sudafed and some Flonase and maybe some amoxicillin. And then, so the patient does kind of feel like they did, you know, I went to the doctor and they said, you know, it's, it's just uh, stuffiness. And then they let it go and they get outside of that treatment window. And as you say, it's so disappointing to see that story because we've lost an opportunity to help that patient. So if you or a loved one or anybody you know has suffered a sudden hearing loss, they need to get into a ENT, an otologist like myself, an audiologist like Dr. Palmer, and get your hearing tested and see if there's something that we can do to reverse the hearing loss, right? Absolutely. You know, and you, you started this by talking about some of the, the noise-induced hearing loss and things we can do, you know, things that your audience can take action on. And certainly with sudden hearing loss, the action is to get into the right health care providers, which would be otology and, and audiology. And in terms of um, noise uh, and and noise, I think people are sometimes misled of what, what noise can be, but in terms of hearing loss, your, your ear doesn't care what the sound is. It's just all about how loud and how long you listen to it. And so noise-induced hearing loss is 100% preventable. And so we, we have a musician's hearing center here um, at UPMC, and one reason we started that is we are certainly here to help people who need hearing aids or cochlear implants or the different medical treatment, but we would love to back up and prevent the hearing loss that we could prevent. Absolutely. And when you think of the, the United States, in terms of the workforce, we do a pretty good job um, in the workforce um, in terms of a lot of professions where you see regulations and you see hearing protection provided and you know you hope the workers are using that but there are whole areas that that aren't regulated uh, all hobbies obviously people have to be thoughtful and, and thinking about themselves but we do focus here on musicians we have a lot of great music here in pittsburgh you certainly have a lot of great music there in new york um, and that's a group that's not regulated and and musicians are really interesting because they remind us that people need to protect their hearing but at the same time they need to hear and that's a really interesting challenge. And with the advent of musician um, earplugs, which is, you know, more than 15 years ago or so now, we can do that. We can protect hearing, but we can decrease all the different sounds equally and with fidelity so things still sound natural. And that's made a big difference for musicians, college bands. We, we go into all the high schools, many, many, many of the high school bands here in the um, southwestern Pennsylvania use hearing protection um, because the reality is you will have hearing loss. You know, if you're a musician that plays with other people, you eventually will have hearing loss. And as you mentioned, it's gradual, so you don't notice it. And then over time, you know, you're the person saying, I don't hear a noise all that well now. Or they're getting ringing in their ears, which for a lot of musicians actually is the worst issue. So, um, you know, be thinking, your audience should be thinking about hearing protection, thinking about dose you know how loud do i listen to things and for how long and wherever you can protect yourself do it because this is permanent and you know people come especially you know to to you as a physician and think you can fix anything and the reality is we can't yeah and it's also additive so that noise induced hearing loss that you get as a 20 year old uh, is going to still be there when you're 50 and 70 year olds and it will be added to uh, with the genetic hearing loss that you may get and any additional noise exposure and it's really due to the fact that those tiny little hair cells inside the tiny little cochlea when they are damaged and or killed by noise excessive noise uh, they don't regrow we don't know how to turn them back on and so that's why as you mentioned that noise induced hearing loss is usually permanent uh, there are some uh, mild, few exceptions to that rule, but in general, we'd like to prevent it, and the way you prevent it is limiting the decibel, the, 
the uh, loudness of the sounds and the duration that you're exposed to it. Really, those are the two variables. So definitely we would like to see that. I, I worry when I'm walking up First Avenue here in New York and I can hear the music coming from the car that's a block ahead of me. Right. I, I know that that person is going to be in my office in yeah. a few years with, with significant sensory neural type hearing loss. That's the type of hearing loss that, that noise induces. So we would love to prevent that. Yeah. Um, let's see, you want to take some co phone calls? We've got a lot of phone calls. Sure, absolutely. Let's do it. If you're just joining us, this is the ENT Show, and we're joined with Dr. Katherine Palmer, who's an audiologist. She's the director of audiology at the University of Pittsburgh, and she's the president-elect of the American Academy of Audiology. We have open phone lines, 877-NYU-DOCS, 877-698-3627. Let's say hello to Debbie from Texas. Debbie, welcome to Dr. Radio. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Yeah. Uh, this is fascinating to me. My only experience with hearing aids was when I took care of my grandmother. Um, I live in an area where the hearing aid storefront places are notoriously shady. Um, but that was kind of my only exposure to how I handle hearing loss. My husband is now going to be 70. He spent his life as a welder. He's got significant hearing loss. And I'd like to bring him somewhere where they can check him out. Where can I take him that I know I'm going to get good expert uh, service and not just a storefront that may be gone three weeks from now? That's such a great question, Debbie. Yeah. So, the you know, what I would recommend you do, um, because I, I'm not exactly sure where you are, but if you go to audiology.org, and you write on that front page, so right when it comes up to the right, you're going to see a button to click that says find an audiologist. And you're going to be able to put in your zip code, and it will, will bring you to the closest um, audiologist who's a member of our academy, and that's going to put you in a good position. And they will be connected with otology. So if, if he needs anything further medically, they can connect you as well. Um, what you're describing, you know, that, that may be something where you, you directly need the audiologist. But, but either way, they're going to be able to connect you to what you need. Okay, and that's not necessarily going to be a brand name hearing aid storefront place. It's going to actually be a doctor's office. That's going to be an audiologist. So audiologists okay. have clinical doctorates, so they have four years of education post-undergraduate. So they are very expert in this area. So when you, when you go to them, they're going to be able to do all the diagnostics. They're going to be able to sit down and do all the counseling and, and help you guys figure out what's the right solution for you. Or if they find that there is really a medical issue, they are either practicing right with an otologist ENT or they're going to be connected to one. So they will make sure you get that care. Awesome. Thank you so much. Debbie, thanks. Great question. And we'll put the audiology.org uh, link up on the Dr. Radio Facebook page and on the Dr. Radio Twitter page also. So if you're driving, don't worry about writing that down. We will have it up there for you. That's really great. So you go to that audiology.org, you put your zip code in, you come up with a, with several answers for you that are in your, uh, in your area. There's also one that we've talked about before on the show, vestibular.org where you can do the same thing, put your zip code in, you come up with a vestibular physical therapist in your area that's trained and licensed, which I think is another very helpful resource for the patients out there. So that's really good. Um, let's say hello to Julie from Florida. Julie, welcome to Dr. Radio. Good morning. How are you? Great. How are you doing? Good, thank you. So um, a year ago, I had a um, uh, sudden hearing loss in my left ear. Um, it happened over probably a 48-hour period, and um, so I went to go see uh, an urgent care doctor, and um, like you spoke of earlier, I was misdiagnosed. I was told that I had an ear infection and that he could actually see uh, the fluid behind the eardrum, and so he put me on antibiotics. Um, a week later, I still had no hearing, and fortunately, being in the medical field, I'm a retired firefighter paramedic, I said, okay, I should not be on antibiotics for a week and have zero um, change. So I called um, a friend of mine who's medical director at a big local hospital here. He got me into an ENT that day immediately. And I was diagnosed with um, SSNHL. Um, that being said, I had four rounds of steroids through um, the eardrum and I probably regained, I would say, 75% of my hearing. 
Um, they say it's probably closer to 80, 85, but the, the tinnitus is so bad mm. that I probably only hear in reality, I probably only hear maybe 30%. So when you're in a quiet room and I take the test, my results are higher than what the real world, you know, feels like. Yeah. So, um, but the, the sad thing is, is that I think this happens quite often. You, um, you said a two month window to fix it. Um, I was told a two week window to fix it. Um, so fortunately I was in within a week of my initial onset. Um, is there anything else? I haven't been back for my one year, um, checkup, but is there typically anything else that can be done other than hearing aids? Well, you're, you are correct in that earlier we diagnose it, the better. I think the treatment is more effective mm -hmm. earlier. At some point, right. that window shuts, and I don't think anybody can actually identify that exact length of time from the onset to when that window okay. shuts, but it, ultimately it shuts. So I do know if you came in to see me now today, for instance, and told me of this story about a year ago, I really wouldn't have any medical therapy that I thought would be effective to reverse this. Where I would, certainly at a week or two weeks, and I would give it up to up to several months. I'm, I'm not going to give up on that ear just because I think someone is uh, five weeks out instead of four weeks out. I'm going to still try and mm -hmm. treat that ear. And for the audience... Right. I got the first injection and then he said if you get improvement you get another injection and so this did go on for I think two months. Yeah, so it's... Until I stopped having improvement. Yeah, so for the audience, you mentioned SNHL, which is the abbreviation for sensory neural hearing loss, and yours is sudden, so sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, and that's the, the diagnosis that Dr. Palmer and I were talking about is an emergency, and we're happy you followed up and didn't just leave it with the urgent care. But I agree with you, Julie, that story is really all too common that people go in, they get amoxicillin or Flonase, and, and that's it. So we want you to go to find an audiologist, find an otologist, and get an accurate diagnosis because time really is of the essence. And uh, I assume you had an MRI as part of your evaluation? I did. I did. I had no tumor, no stroke, nothing that, that, that they could tie to it other than, um, you know, I am, a, I am a retired firefighter, but that's not when it happened. I've been retired for three years. And this just literally I had a headache one day, and I was deaf the next day. Yeah. So... Number one, thank you for your service, and number two, I'm glad you got treated. That for the audience out there, the treatment options for someone with sudden sensory neural hearing loss like Julie is there's really three things. There's this middle ear steroid injection where the otologist or the ENT doctor will place a very, very small needle through the ear and put steroid directly into the middle ear, which then gets absorbed by the inner ear. And we know from animal studies that we can get a very high concentration of steroid into the inner ear doing it this way. Uh, and there's various ways to do this. I chaired a panel last year at a national meeting and had five docs on the podium or on the panel with me, and uh, each, of it, each of us did it slightly differently. So that tells you that science doesn't guide us at this point in time to the, to the best practice. What's the best way to do this? There's very little risk with that procedure, but there's really there's really not any procedure that I'm aware of that has no risk. I think there's an excruciatingly small risk that I could create a perforation in your eardrum by doing those injections. So we want to always balance risk versus benefit when we're really thinking about any procedure as a surgeon. That's kind of our job is to is to assess the risk and benefit potentials and then act accordingly. The other option is oral steroids, and we we usually do. Uh, high dose oral steroids unless there's a reason not to the patients a brittle diabetic or the patient's early uh, trimester pregnancy and then the third thing is hyperbaric oxygen so I don't know did you go through oral steroids and did you try hyperbaric I, just I out of curiosity oral. I did oral not hyperbaric okay. my insurance probably would not have covered hyperbaric yeah I think um, that's what we see a lot is that the insurance doesn't cover hyperbaric and they don't cover it routinely because the data is not strong on how effective hyperbaric oxygen is. Uh, but those are really the three things. Now that you're in a position with stable but uneven or asymmetric sensory neural hearing loss, there's a couple things that we counsel to. One is hearing aid. In the case of a devastating loss that never recovers, which we'd call single-sided deafness, then Catherine can speak about the, some of the non-surgical options, which would really be a cross 
type of hearing aid, which in my experience have come a long way. People routinely did not really find those very helpful 15, 20 years ago. And I would say now uh, I have a number of patients that find those uh, to be helpful. What do you think, uh, Catherine? Yeah, I agree. I was going to say, you know, one of the issues of a sudden hearing loss is it's really very traumatic, obviously, for the person, and they're they're immediately or hopefully immediately and good for you for, for, um, you know, pursuing care, you know, getting treatment, certainly hoping for the best. And as you said, we see a variety of outcomes. You know, sometimes we'll see um, a resolution of the loss, sometimes a partial resolution, which your caller is describing, and sometimes not. So as they move beyond that, they have a relationship with the audiologist who's been doing the testing, and and, and at some point, um, it's time to kind of think about, okay, he, here we are, which is what you were saying. So in that, um, if you've lost, if someone has lost all the hearing in one ear, there are a few different things uh, we can do with that. And one is called a cross. And what you're doing there is you're actually putting a microphone on the side that no longer hears. So that's an ear that if you put sound into it, that's not going to do you any good at all. So you put a microphone on that side, and actually wirelessly the sound goes over to your ear that's that's good and so you're able to hear things that are on that side and it's very helpful and you're absolutely right the the technology has come such a long way with it being wireless and and you know really performing well we always like to caution people that um, once you are not hearing on one side it is very hard to know where things are coming from and it's hard to hear a noise because it turns out we really have two ears for a reason and they help us localize because sound hits the ears differently and part of that helps us sort out what we're trying to hear in noise so when you lose hearing in one ear we can put this type of device and it'll help you a lot if someone is standing on the side that doesn't hear because you will now hear them but it still won't help you localize or hearing noise that well so that's frustrating um, and we, we really work with people on communication strategies and how to kind of manipulate um, the communication environment to to help with those issues um, if you've lost hearing in that ear but it's aidable then it, then a hearing aid is, is going to be the solution that will help and I, I would comment that one thing your caller is commenting on is the, the tinnitus the roaring sound that she has which um, does come sometimes with sudden hearing loss and they are nice data to show that, that using amplification can really help um, not notice that sound. I don't want to say it makes the sound go away because it doesn't, but the, the concept is if we keep the auditory system busy processing other things, so a well-fit hearing aid, you're going to hear low-level sounds and, and really there are always sounds around us. It in essence keeps your system busy and you're not um, attending to or paying attention to that really disturbing internal sound. So So there are people even with minimal hearing loss or normal hearing that, that experience tinnitus or ringing or roaring, that we can really actually help with low gain um, devices set correctly to help them not be so overwhelmed or noticing that sound. So that's another thing to consider as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And from the, you know, Julie, from the surgical uh, perspective, there's some new interesting technology coming out. There are new advances in bone implantable hearing aids coming out, uh, some that are thought to be re released in uh, late late this year, early 2020. Uh, and at NYU here at our NYU Cochlear Implant Center, we are doing cochlear implants for profound sensory neural hearing loss on one side, so-called single-sided deafness. I don't think you're probably a candidate for that, uh, given your degree of hearing. But for patients that, that were like you and got no return, uh, a cochlear implant can be a great option for those people. It's not FDA approved for single-sided deafness because they never sought that indication back in the early days when they got approval from the FDA for cochlear implants. But it has been shown to work. We just published a study at NYU on that. And so it, it can be especially effective at suppressing tinnitus. So that's also another thing that we counsel patients about when we talk to patients about single-sided deafness, sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Hope that was helpful, Julie. Thank you. I appreciate it. The only thing that I would add is that because you have such a short window uh, to get in to see somebody, and um, typically ENTs, <clears throat> excuse me, are backed up for months, um, that it kind of poses a problem. Um, it almost as though you all need like a code word. If we, you know, say the the, the term sudden, <clears throat> it would be better if we could, you know, if they could get in to see you sooner. But I know it was going to be a couple of months before I could get in. Well, so I couldn't I agree with you more. a medical director that made that that call for me. I would have lost my hearing totally, probably. Yeah, and if you're out there listening to this, I would agree with Julie. Be a patient and push. At our office, I can tell you, we do have that 
code word. So if you call up and tell us you have sudden hearing loss, we get you in and overbook you and try, try and see you within 24 hours. In fact, we'll, we make a commitment to see you within 24 hours. So I couldn't agree with you more. And that's the same with UPMC. So I'd say it's it's probably a little bit your larger centers. Um, and I think that's on on us um, as professionals to educate our um, our peers, you know, primary care and different people um, to make sure in terms of triage um, that that's understood uh, for sure. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. Julie, great call. Brought up a ton of great issues. Thank you very much. We are going to need to take a short break.